How are you? What have you been up to recently? Um, I'm okay. I've been, uh, well, I've got to another single coming out fairly shortly so i've been uh, doing all the build up to that yeah so, cool. uh, nothing wildly okay. exciting you know, i've been in the studio at the moment doing kind of other bits and bobs i've got the to capture the show i did the music for on the bbc is just coming out now so to be honest we've only just finished that even though they're actually broadcasting the series cool you might have to do a live performance as it went out oh that's really cool it would have been <laughs> time I have to sit there whacking some drums and fucking... <laughs> have you been doing loads of press then not loads no i think they're saving most of the press around for the album that's, mm. the, that's the big push really so we've done some bits and bobs yeah okay cool well speaking of the album then you said yeah. that radio songs came together over a couple of years how did that project first come about oh blimey um well the yeah i suppose how did it first come about it came about really when i was thinking about uh i mean the ideas for the songs you know i'm constantly making music so it's not like i sat down one day and thought i know what i'll do i'll make an album i'm always yeah. writing songs doing bits and pieces you know but the kind of concept for for the the, the songs i'm working on at the book uh, you know that I'm putting together at the moment came about really when I was thinking about uh, my life growing up and the kind of the the the, the importance that sort of radio has played in in various ways throughout my life. You know, so the, the how the, a lot of the songs are to do with that. At least that's the kind of inspiration for them, even if they don't they don't actually talk about that. You know, literally in the lyrics. That was the kind yeah. of the inspiration for it all. And, you know, but so London Bridge really is a bit of an outlier. London Bridge being the single that's just been out. That was about something else, really, because once you start thinking about this kind of stuff, and especially once you start writing things down, it kind of, you know, takes you off in interesting directions. Yeah. And, uh, di you know, takes you down down a bunch of, uh, not necessarily blind alleys, but down, uh, you know, some interesting, interesting uh, labyrinths that you wouldn't have otherwise gone down. And it got me thinking about the couple of times in my life when uh, when an unusual thing has happened, I suppose it's a kind of obsessive behaviour, but sort of quite normal, really, equally, in that when I was a kid, that when I was a kid, when I was a young teenager living in Colchester and growing up there, there was a, a particular number just seemed to seem to come up over and over again. And the more the more I noticed it, the more I noticed it. So pretty yeah. much, pretty soon, it was kind of overwhelming. Like this is number every everywhere I look, stupid number. What's going on? <laughs> Somebody's sort of dangling this. Is there's some kind of weirdo running around in front of me putting this number up anywhere? <laughs> I know what I you know I know what that is. That's a that's a, a trick your brain plays on you. You know your brain is a pattern recognizer and uh, it's far better at spotting patterns than it is at spotting when the pattern is no longer there so you know you look at a thousand bushes it sees you, you notice the one where it looks like it's a tiger about to jump on you and you know for good evolutionary reasons you know that's the reason yeah. we're fundamentally derived from herd animals and it's the reason we've managed to last the millions of years we have on the planet is that we're kind of doubly suspicious of anything that looks like a tiger <laughs> So it's called confirmation bias, and uh, and uh, that's one one of the aspects of this thing, this pattern recognizer, in that uh, in your you, you, your brain tends to confirm ideas you already have and notice confirmations of it, and not notice things that count against it. You know, so every time I saw the number twelve, I didn't go, "Oh, that's weird. That's not the number I'm seeing everywhere." But every time I saw the number one two six, I thought, "That's weird. That's the number I'm seeing everywhere." Now, I knew that, you know, I'm a I'm reasonably educated person. I, I, I'm I taking interest in these things. What was interesting was how even though I knew what was going on, it didn't make the effect of it any less powerful. You know, the rational part of me knew that this was confirmation bias. But the, the brainstem part, the, the millions of years old lizard brain bit of me was still going, ah, it's the number, it's the number. <laughs> so, it happened this has happened a couple of times in my life a second time was around london bridge station where uh, i started noticing things 
you know, odd odd coincidences and things like that. Nothing remarkable, you know. I'm not saying there's nothing to do with the London Bridge bombings or I mean the London Bridge attacks or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Just odd things, you know. My the, the early days of the band, which started to give me a, a thing about London Bridge, not me making making me plot my journeys elsewhere, so I didn't have to go past London Bridge, you know. And so again, I knew what was going on. I knew there was no. London Bridge wasn't a magic station which caused weird things to happen. You know, I'm not kind of naive like that. Yeah. Just the idea that, you know, that the, I, the fact that I that I had I knew how my brain was deceiving me didn't make the fact that my brain was deceiving me any less powerful. Yeah. And that that kind of carried on in, as that realization that knowledge won't help you when it comes to dealing with your brain. It's something that saved my bacon several times in my life because, you know, I'm not somebody who's had, I'm not, this is not something I'm talking about in this interview or anything to do with the record, but I'm not somebody that's had perfect mental health throughout my entire life, you know, and, uh, and uh, the realization that, um, you know, having, ha having, have, having those kind of issues, you can't learn your way out of that, you know, yeah read a book and make that go away you can't go now i'm the now i'm you know it, otherwise nobody no kind of doctors would ever have medical problems and no psychiatrists mm -hmm. would ever have psychiatric problems yeah. you know, knowledge is a very is a i'm not knocking it I'm, there's nothing more powerful than knowledge and nothing more uh, uh, enabling in life than uh, learning and knowledge and wisdom and all of those things but they don't help you when it comes to what your brain is doing yes uh, and for that you need different kinds of help and uh, so that's that's what London Bridge is all about really you know and that's what the changing change my mind bit about it is it's like the oh I see so that learning from uh, from the kind of you know the weird number and the London Bridge thing the kind of the the light bulb moment where that that the, the understanding of that there is no relationship between the, you know, between your knowledge and your lizard brain, you know, one won't save you from the other, translates okay. into other areas of life. That's so that in the in the long that's the long answer. <laughs> <laughs> Having all those really powerful themes then behind London Bridge, is that why you selected it to be the lead single or the first single? No, I thought it was the I thought it was the most likely to get played on the radio. That's why I selected it for the first single. I no. thought it was important new project you know i'm essentially a new artist the whole thing yeah. is new. you know it's, it's important i think at the launch of it that it gets noticed yeah so i thought uh yeah probably most likely to get played the, out of all the songs and it was one that was finished that's a, also another great positive it's best to release the songs that you finished <laughs> fair enough well because it's interesting that you talk about being a new artist because yeah. I was going to ask like being already such a known musician from one of the biggest British bands out did that affect your approach to this project and to solo work and is that notoriety something that you want to distance yourself from as an individual or do you embrace that um well to take the last thing first I think you can you can't distance yourself from it or embrace it it simply is a fact you know it's yeah. like um but uh i'm not embarrassed about being the drummer in blur i did that nobody nobody gave me that that, okay, that the blur success came about through bloody hard work through the four of us so uh you know i'm i'm happy to use that in whatever areas of my life i can hmm. without making apologies for that but um it's uh, it's an unexpected thing i think for people meet for me to release a solo album it kind of for the rest of the world, I imagine that probably came out of nowhere. Nobody knows that this is the kind of thing I do, you know. And uh, so, um, it was. I, I. It was important for me not to do the obvious thing, which would be some kind of drum-based percussion thing, you know, or uh, drumming on something. Because uh, even though I'm the drummer in Blur, I don't really see myself as a drummer. I never, mm -hmm. never. Have. That's just one of the things I do. Mm. A musician first and a, a drummer second, really, and I kind of always have been. Always mm -hmm. been more interested in music than in drumming. 
So um, it was important for me to kind of set, set out a sort of marker and kind of not do the obvious, you know, get a band together and play some rock music, which has some drum solos in. Yeah. yeah. But then it's very difficult to define yourself in terms of a negative. So, you know, having said what I don't want it to be, still left an infinity of things mm -hmm. that it could be. So that, I didn't find, find that particularly helpful. But uh, one of the ways that having those kind of, having those kind of thought processes can be helpful and why they're not a waste of time. I haven't found them to be a waste of time. It's, and, and I often play those games in blur. It's because if you do, if you, if you take some decisions early on, they can affect the music down the line in some quite unexpected ways. And that the, um, the example I often give is on the, on the um, Blur album Think Tank, I decided at the start that I wasn't going to play any drums on the record. You know, I was going to have, have drum sounds, but I was going to, um, I was going to make all those sounds in different ways. One of the, one of the yeah, so if I decided not to have a drum kit on the, on the think tank and so make all those sounds in other ways. And so it, 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 it gets you thinking about the music making in a different way, you know, rather than just being able to lazily sit down in front of a kit and know that, know that, um, you know, I can, I can, in a relatively straightforward way, come up with some rhythms and it's going to sound good and it'll, it'll be fine. You know, suddenly you have to yeah. think about well, what, what does a bass drum sound like? What, what in the context of this song might be a, an alternative way of making that noise, you know, yeah. like that up, but it turns it into a much more challenging process and, and takes you down, down some unexpected paths. And it, at the end, there was drum kits on Think Tank, you know, it didn't matter that there, you know, there was no benefit in being purist about it. Some of the way, some of the songs, you just thought, well, it's good to have drum kit on this, you know, and that's yeah. that. <laughs> uh, but it, it meant that that small early decision radically changed how the mm. drum sounded. Because if you're not if you're not sitting in front of a drum kit, you're having to actually make the sounds in a different way. So the kind of order in which you play them is necessarily different because the technique is different and stuff like yeah. that. You see what I mean? So similarly with this with my album, I didn't want to do. I didn't want to do what people would have expected me to do. So then I started thinking, well, what do people expect me to do? Well, mm -hmm. and then you can tap tie yourself in knots going, well, hang on, people, people know I'm fairly contrary. Won't they think I'll try and do what's not expected on me? <laughs> Probably then what they're expecting is, to, is for, what they're not expecting is for me to do the obvious. Maybe I should be doing a drum bass. <laughs>